Hey, Aaron, welcome back to the Total Potential Podcast. It's Cole with a very special guest today. I'm so excited to share her story and all of her amazing insights. Um, Jessie Torres is a high performance coach, an author, a speaker, and a transformational leader. She is the founder of Fierce Grace Transformation. And from my experience of her, I can attest to just the light and fire that is within this woman. And I just can't wait to share it with you. Jesse, thank you so much for being here with me today. I just appreciate your time so much. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I really feel like you just have so much like light and fire and insight to share with our audience. But before we, you know, dive into that, I'm so interested to know, you know, what are some of the more formative events, would you say that kind of led you to this space where you like transformation became the thing, the thing that you wanted to do for yourself and for others? What, what would you say are some of the more kind of high level events that happened? Well, the truth of the matter is, um, I always say sometimes we don't know what we've got until our knees hit the floor. Mm. <laughs> and for me, um, it was definitely uh, the evolution of the break of my marriage, okay. um, which for me was devastating. Uh, that was just something I, I, I was going to go to my grave in that marriage. You know what I mean? But I, I actually did in, any, in every way that a human can. Mm. Um, it was that state of apathy where I'm just hoping somebody would kind of blow the red light because my kids being, um, basically they're the reason I'm still alive because because of them, there's no way that I could actually take my own life, but I was hoping somebody else would, you know, and, mm -hmm. and coming to that state and then finally having the courage to, you know, leave my marriage. It, it, it was so devastating to me that it sent me on a massive obsession and quest to understand human beings. Mm. You know, I wanted to understand why my dad did what he did and his abuse with me, why my mother allowed it, why my husband did what he did and why I allowed it, mm. you know? And so I wanted to study, I wanted to understand, I wanted to have clarity that how at 38 years old did I end up in a place where I didn't even know who I was. Mm. Yeah. How, okay. So you hit this point where you're just like, I, I love that phrase you use like on your knees, like what else can I do here? Where, where did you even start? Like, was it reading? Was it like a spiritual co connection? Like, how did you even start? Yeah. Okay. So I want to learn about human behavior, but how did you start to like turn that in to what you could do to, you know, cause I mean, I know lots of people who read lots of books and their lives are very much the same. Right. So how did you take that into then action? Yeah. Great question. Um, you know, I actually was someone that didn't enjoy reading. Not that I didn't enjoy it. I just would always fall asleep, mm. <laughs> but I think the first thing I did was start reading. I did start reading. Um, I remember two book two books that stand out as some of the first ones I read. One was by Cheryl Richardson called The Unmistakable Touch of Grace. Mm. And that opened me up to believing that there was something that, that I was worthy of something more. Um, and then there was another one by um, um, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name, but he wrote the book um, of Scott Peck. Um, and it was called uh, The People of the Lie, mm -hmm. Understanding Human Evil. And I don't know why I picked up that book. I don't even know the reference to it. But what I remember was learning and understanding what narcissism meant. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have any language for what I had experienced and understanding what that means and how somebody that can be so profoundly hurt who loved you and now bite you the minute you step, stick your hand in the cage, the cage, you know what I mean? It's just kind of like, it's from their depth of pain and it allowed me to have compassion for the people in my life that hurt me. Mm. And it at, least, at least had me see through a different set of lenses of understanding, still didn't make it right, but at least I saw it from a different perspective. And from that, it led into, um, again, either meetups or workshops or wanting to do what other people, where else can I find how to understand this human experience? Um, and then my sister who was in real estate 
and real estate people are kind of always seeking, you know, coaching or sure. some additional thing. Oh, you know, even before that though, my um, therapist, I was actually going to a therapist trying to, you know, help myself evolve from all of this. And um, I told her, I want to do what you do. You know, I said, but that's a lot of school and a lot of time. And my kids were, my kids were teenagers at the time. And it's just like, she goes, well, why don't you get into coaching? And I said, what is that? Like, I literally was like, you know, soccer, soccer mom coach. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and, and back then this was like in 2004, 2005, um, you know, it wasn't as big as it is right now. Sure. You know? And so she told me what it was. And I started just seeking for, you know, a school or something where I can learn. And then my sister came along with this um, seminar that she was going to. She had an extra ticket in Los Angeles. And in real estate, they have Mike Ferry, who's a real estate coach, but he had a son, Matthew Ferry. And this was tickets for his event, which was more around personal development than it was real estate. Okay. And I remember sitting in that audience and it was small. I'd say maybe, I don't know, maybe a hundred people. Um, you know, he had the sabotage voice was called the drunk monkey, which I thought was really funny, <laughs> um, but it kind of gave you like perspective to like those silly thoughts that come in your mind that are disempowering and kind of put a, a funny drunk monkey on there yeah. to, to show you how silly it is. But when he was up on stage, he said, at one point he said, well, you know what? You know, my mentor, Tony Robbins says, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, huh? Well, I like this guy. I've never, I've never seen anything like this before. And if his mentor is Tony Robbins, well, I need to find out who this Tony Robbins guy is. Yeah. Um, you know, and then my cousin who worked for uh, Hughes Aircraft, which is now Boeing, um, she got head tickets to UPW for Tony Robbins. And um, at this point, I had already gone through my coaching certification through Coaches Training Institute. Um, which by the way is amazing. Whenever you go through a certification like that, you actually, you know, go through coaching yourself. So yeah. <laughs> as you're learning the coaching skills, you're bringing up your own real life processes. And so there was a lot that happened to me in my own awakening through learning how to be a coach. And then when I entered the Tony Robbins world, I was just like, oh my God, like this is, it, it was such an incredible energy and such um, a, uh, just a whole different like world than I had known. I was so kept and I was so scared. And I was like, I didn't even know how to drive out of my own city. I had to buy a Thomas guide when I got divorced, like, mm. because I was just so kept, you know, I could only go to the grocery store. And, and, um, and so I saw the energy in that. And I, and I thought, wow, what must it be like to be a part of this community? Yeah. And, you know, and, and I started asking questions at this stage of the game, I was working full time um, and trying to grow my coaching business on my, you know, barely couple of hours after work. And I was trying to make it happen. And um, I decided to apply at Tony Robbins to become a coach. And, you know, they get thousands and thousands of resumes and um, it was really, you know, tough. I submitted it and I, I kept going to other events, Tony's events. Um, I brought my family, I brought my kids, um, you know, and, and we all uh, experienced that a lot, a lot of beauty. And then um, I had submitted my resume and I kept asking the, the coaches or the people at the booths, you know, hey, I submitted my resume, you know, what's going on? And they're like, oh, you just got to keep bugging. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be a pest. There are no be a pest. You have to keep bugging. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. And then one of the gentlemen said, well, you know, the director of coaching is here at this event. And the event that I was at was business mastery where I was wanting to grow my coaching business and I wanted the tools, that event was $10,000, okay? I was crawling out of a very nasty divorce. I don't know if my FICO score was even at 500. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and I was robbing Peter to pay Paul and I was living in an apartment after having a 3,000 square foot home, you know? And, and I was just trying to crawl out when the guy told me that it's a $10,000 offer. I was just like, you're out of your mind. I was choked on my coffee. But when he got me so connected to believing that it was going to be the answer to my prayers and growing my coaching business, um, he, I didn't think of my 401k. Mm -hmm. And so I, I cashed in my 401k. I think I borrowed a little bit from my mom and I had like five little, like $500 credit cards that I was trying to use to rebuild my credit. 
And I went. So when I got there, I, I told the sales guy, I said, look, you're going to have to find me a room that's cheap because I cannot afford a room at the Bellagio in Vegas. <laughs> after I've given you everything I have, you know, and, and it ended up working out. And he said, look, I, I was, I, I had already gone to the Bellagio and found the 24 hour fitness that was closest to the hotel. And I was going to drive to Vegas. I was living in California at the time. And, and I was going to sleep in my car and shower at the gym. That's what I was going to do to save money. But luckily at the last minute he called and he said, Hey, I talked it over with my wife and she said, it's totally fine. I have two beds in my room. If you want to just share one, I'll charge you 25 bucks. Like done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know these events go really long into the wee hours of the night and you don't spend that much time in your room anyway. So, right. so that's how I ended up doing this. So when this guy said the director of coaching is at the event, I was like laser focused on everybody's name tag. And I didn't even remember his name fully. You know, I was trying to mark, mark Vaughn something, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's like a five day um, event. So I'm looking at everybody's name tag. So day four, um, I'm trying to find a place to eat. You know, again, I'm broker than broke. Yeah. So I'm like, I walked outside of the Bellagio and I found this little cafe and it had $10 salads. So I'm like, okay, I'll do a $10 salad. I'm standing in line <clears throat> and again, I'm looking at everybody's name tag and I hear the conversation in front of me is about the event. And so I was like, oh my God, they're, they're from the event. And so I look at the name tags and I'm like, oh, like there he is, there he is. Oh my God, that's him. I think that's him. And I've been listening to them talking and now I'm totally like panicky. They go up and they, they order and they move to the side and they're still talking. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Where am I going to do? I'm like, you know, at a Tony Robbins event. So I'm like, yeah. step up, Jesse, step up. You know, I'm telling like, <laughs> And I'm like, okay, I order whatever I order. And I walk right up to him and I say, I'm so sorry for interrupting. Excuse me. I just want to let you know, I turned in my resume and I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jesse Torres. Okay. And um, he said, oh, he goes, I remember you. You speak Spanish, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. We talked for like 20 minutes. And the last thing he said to me was, I will call you. And true to his word, he called me and I became a Tony Robbins coach. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay. So I am so curious to know, because even just the, the scenario you just described to me, that takes tons of courage, like to just go and do it and be laser focused, right. The whole time you're there to cash in your 401k, like every step of that takes a ton of courage. How, how did you go from a, an environment where you were kept that I, that was a really interesting word that you used, like so tightly kept to the courage to just like, go get it. Like, what are some of the things that really stand out to you as ways that you cultivated courage along the way? I so love this question. Um, because it's something that I'm so passionate about now is that we are not taught to notice how courageous we are. Mm. And so when I identified myself as being so fearful, so scared that I, I, I didn't want to, because anything I did that might upset my ex would cause an explosion and it was just bad. So whenever we are captivated by fear so often, but we're still alive, <laughs> mm. what we don't acknowledge is that if we're navigating fear all the time, we're constantly accessing courage hmm. because that's whenever, whenever somebody tells me that they're scared or da, 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 I'm like, well, then to me, I see a courageous person because if you're navigating through fear all the time, you are building massive courage because courage does not exist without fear. Hmm. That is and an it, interesting perspective. Yeah. I love that. So I didn't even know that there was courage within me until I started to challenge myself. I was in survival. So I, I needed, it's like, if it scared me, I leaned in. And so I, I would love for people to see themselves that way, that courage is not something you have to borrow. It's in us all, you know? I mean, courage, even if you're like afraid to go to the dentist, but you go, but you go, yeah, <laughs> you're accessing courage, right? And then courage is really a frequency of the heart. It's an essence of where we're ste stepping into. So we all have massive levels of it. We're just not taught to recognize it because we remember how scared we were, not how courageous we were. 
Mm, I think that is a really beautiful flip. You also just used the word that you were in survival. And I would love to peel that apart a little bit because um, in our community, we are raising families, right? Like people are, you know, getting their hands dirty, running around like the whole nine yards with young families. And um, my sense is that a lot of us feel like we're in survival, even if it's not like physical safety survival can feel like we're in survival mode, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, in the hamster wheel. What do you say to the person who feels like they're kind of in that and like the same stories happening day after day after day? And we, number one, how do we become aware that that is the story that we're telling ourselves that we're just surviving, that we're just getting by. But then number two, like, how do we start to flip it <laughs> so that we're not <laughs> just in that every day? Well, you know, what's great about that. And, and you mentioned story. What we don't realize is that we're the authors, hmm. right? So our story can be, you know, I'm in a vicious hamster wheel. This is exhausting. I'm so fed up. I mean, with soccer, ballet, you know, uh, I don't know, polo. I mean, I'm just like a, a taxi cab and, and a chef. You know what I mean? It's like, um, and yes, and there's another truth. There's another story. Um, there's the ability to give your kids more than you had. There's the ability to, you know, be able to even, I mean, like when I grew up, we walked, you know, to school and, you know, and we made our own snacks when we got home, you know, and we didn't dare turn on the TV until our homework was done, you know, and, and it's like, and, and I think that, you know, I remember sometimes waiting for hours after school to be picked up when we moved and I had to, I, we, we, our school was in a different district and that was just the way it was, yeah. you know? Yeah. So what I would lean into is number one is gratitude, you know, stepping into what we can be grateful for. What story do we want to write? You know, the opportunity to be there for our children, the opportunity to you know, like, uh, my daughter and I joke around, but the car for us, we call it like a portal mm -hmm. <laughs> because the conversations that happen on that car ride sometimes are the most profound. Yes. So take advantage <laughs> of it. You know, I, I love the question, like, even if you're driving your kids to school, I love the question, you know, whose life will be better because of you today. Mm, and if you kind of plant that seed with your children, and so that they are looking for opportunities to make somebody's life better. And then when they come home for dinner, they're like, okay, so whose life was better because of you today, right? Yeah. And you start creating this practice of applying goodness in the world. All of a sudden, those car portal moments are the best. Mm -hmm. um, they're moments to share. They're moments to connect. They're moments to find out maybe there's something your, your child wants to say to you. Yeah. But I think sometimes in the busyness of all of it, we get caught up and just a hurry up, hurry up, grab your stuff. Oh my God, we're running late and your sister's going to be late. We're gonna, that we're not taking that opportunity to open up that portal in those car moments and um, use it. It's like um, Tony Robbins used to call it net time, mm -hmm. not enough time, <laughs> right? So in those moments where you think you don't have enough time, sometimes just the 20 minutes to school could be time to use to either have a conversation with your children or, you know, even put on a podcast that's empowering and, yeah. you know, embeds really good things in them. There's a lot, a lot that we can do in those moments, but you got to tell yourself the story that no matter what I'm doing in my day, I'm going to optimize every minute hmm. because we only get our kids a short period of time and the rest of their lives they are adulting. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you use the car example. Cause I have a 15 year old son. He's our oldest. And, um, you know, he'll keep making comments like, mom, this is the last soccer season that you'll have to drive me. And, you know, he's excited to drive. Right. So I'm trying to encourage him and yeah, buddy, I, like a, that'll be so fun for you and whatever, but inside I'm actually dreading it because of what you just said. Like the car is like this very precious time where we're <laughs> with each other. There's nothing else going on. We get to talk. Like I just, yeah, I love that you use that example. I'm actually dreading him getting his license because of just that one part, like all that time that he's transporting now will be different. Um, yeah, I can appreciate that all the way. What about, okay. So you also not only tons of courage, get out of the story of survival, but also, I mean, there's a certain level of self-care practices that we have to do, uh, 
to really start to hone ourselves and find what is in ourselves so that we're, you know, not the story of, you know, something else or somebody's past or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people there, that feels really selfish. And like, that's something I've been working so hard is to like shift the narrative on that being selfish. But I'd love to hear your perspective because you have grown children <laughs> who, yes. you know, with, like when you're in it, sometimes it can feel like, oh, well, I took an extra 20 minutes to do a breathing practice, or I went to bed a little earlier, like whatever the thing is, but how, how do you start to like really have that prioritization for yourself in recognition that it not only serves you, but also them or, and also them, I guess would be the better way to say that. Yeah, I think what's important about that question is that we define what it is for us. What is selfish versus self-care? And we have clarity around that because oftentimes we define that by other people's standards. Right. Uh, Society, uh, you know, our parents or people that influence us is just like, you know, what do you mean you were 10 minutes late? You, you know, well, because I took, you know, 10 minutes to meditate or whatever. And all of a sudden you're judged, you know, and it's just like, well, no, I just woke up a little, you know, you're making excuses. Like once you define, like, again, the oxygen mask in the airplane, right? It's like, we know, we know the concept but we get driven by what societal standards are, or we don't even realize it's an unconscious conditioning that actually is not really our core belief. Mm -hmm. So we have to get clear on what belief we own in regards to our self care and what that looks like. Now, if your self care means that you don't start your day till two o'clock in the afternoon, (laughs) then it might be something to look at, but my hunch is it isn't. My hunch is, is that you are sacrificing yourself way more than you are taking care of yourself. And it just doesn't serve because what ends up happening is it's a spiral that puts you in a state of exhaustion, even a little resentment, even though the kids are the love of your life, like you love them, you would do anything for them, but you start to feel resentful, you're a little bit short tempered, you're frustrated because nobody sees how much you're putting out. And you know what I mean? And it's just like, nobody appreciates me. And I don't even have 10 minutes for myself and fit it up. It's just like, okay, but that's not on them. That's on you. Right. And so when you take that time for yourself, you are not only preparing your human vehicle and your essence and your mindset and your emotions to be able to handle whatever the day brings, but you are also teaching them to take care of themselves because our children do not do what we tell them. They do what we show them. Absolutely. And Brene Brown said this, which I absolutely loved. Um, she, she was doing a book signing and people were asking her, you know, how could I be the best parent I could possibly be? And she said, don't ask how you can be the best parent, ask how you could be the best adult you want your children to become. And I absolutely love that because if we don't mimic what we want our children to do, don't expect them to do it. Hmm. You look at your children and you're like, you have to take care of yourself, honey. You have to make sure you did it, did it up, but you're not doing and you're satiated and you're exhausted and you're tired and you're not taking care of yourself. They're not going to do it. Yeah. You know, so super important. But first, number one comes your belief about it. Yeah. How do you support people in identifying what those core beliefs even are? My, uh, my experience has been that for a lot of us, there's not a ton of awareness about what our core beliefs are because they happen so innately. They, you know, they're like reflex just come out of us. What practices or, you know, um, journal, like what, what comes up for you as one of the more powerful ways to start to identify what those core beliefs really are for an individual? Well, I've tested it. (laughs) So if I don't take the time to meditate and to just be in stillness, to be one with my creator and and open up for what wisdom wants to come in. My day goes extremely different, (laughs) just does. So I get to decide what I want with that, right? So there's a certain list that are non-negotiables and they're just non-negotiables. And, you know, I had to get to this, like, you know, working out, you know, it's like, There's been a lot going on, moving, blah, blah, blah. blah. And so there's always kind of, oh, well, you know what? I'll start next week because I'm just tired because blah, blah, blah. Whereas the belief is it's like brushing my teeth. 
Hmm. It, it happens every day. Okay. So the thing is you get to write the rules, but you've got to do it from the context of you taking care of you, like putting mommy brain aside for a moment, being realistic that you're always going to do what's best for your children, but you have to define what works for you. Is it a walk in the morning to clear your head for 30 minutes and that's non-negotiable, or maybe it's meditation or prayer or journaling for 30 minutes every day. Um, I don't remember the author who wrote uh, um, the, something about the art, the artist way. Mm. And she talked about morning pages and it was just literally, even before you get out of bed, you grab your journal and you just journal about whatever it is. Maybe it's your day. Maybe it's a dream you had, maybe it's whatever, but you're just allowing your brain to get extracted because if you don't, it's a big tornado (laughs) of things you have to do. You have to get done everything you haven't done, you know, and it's all that stuff, which could bring, which could invite a very critical mind. I have this, I can carry here for my clients, a big gavel, (laughs) because I think this gavel comes out a lot, especially as moms. We really beat ourselves up and the judge consistently is at the ready to tell you how you're not doing it right or what you didn't do yesterday and, you know, don't even bother today. And so we have to be the gatekeeper of our mind. So I say prepare morning rituals and have a, have a family meeting, you know, with total, I want to be the best version of myself for all of you, because I love you so much. You guys are my everything in order for me to be at my best. Here are the things that I am asking as part of my morning rituals that I'm asking for you guys to honor for me so that I can do what's best for you. And, you know, and just literally set out that, that foundation and it's, it's whatever it is right for you. It doesn't have to be like Sally's down the street. It doesn't have to be like Mabel's down the, you know, the other block, like really, what is it for you? For some, maybe a good 10 minutes is good enough. But just be mindful that you make those rules with the truth about what serves you, not with you sacrificing yourself for everyone. Yeah. I'm excited that this podcast is brought to you by mkforhealth.com. Have you been looking for a powerful antioxidant to help support your immune health? Hello, of course we have. Look no further. MKforHealth.com offers an amazing product called Nutrametrics OPC3. This product is an isotonic capable food supplement chock full of powerhouse antioxidants. Ingredients like citrus extract bioflavonoids, bilberry, grapeseed, red wine, and pine bark extracts, all incredible antioxidants. Then you have the OPCs, the oligomeric proanthrocyanidins are bioflavonoids found in fruits, vegetables, and certain tree barks that have exceptional benefit to the human body. Studies have shown that these OPCs are up to 20 times more powerful than vitamin C and 50 times more powerful than vitamin E in neutralizing free radicals. Hello, sign me up for that. Nutrametrics OPC3 also contains the only isotonic form of pigogenol in the world. Number one, remember, isotonic, readily absorbed. Number two, pigogenol, my new favorite word, is a natural plant extract from the bark of a French marine thyme pine tree, and it is the most clinically researched and potent bioflavonoid found. If you're ready to support your immune health and modulate inflammation in your system, all with incredible powerhouse antioxidants, natural extracts, and ingredients, whew, this is your product. Go to www.mkforhealth.com to purchase your Nutrametrics OPC3 today. That's www.mk, the number four, health.com. I love that as a practice. I can even imagine, right, just sitting down and like, what are the rules of what I really like in my soul feel like I need to follow? Mm -hmm. And that almost instantaneously, you could probably identify what the story is because there's going to be a ton of resistance, right, to actually putting that into play. (laughs) Like, oh, interesting. Well, I have a belief that blank because I don't want to do this thing that I know like makes me feel like a whole human being, but I I don't want to do it. It's like that gap right there could be present for somebody instantaneously, which is so cool. And then I love your point about test it. Like, yeah. Okay. So we have this idea, right. Of for some, it is like maybe uh, nutrition or uh, exercise is sort of that first line, like thing to go to as a practice, right? Because it's very pervasive and easy to find in, in, in all communities. 
Um, but then test it. Like, does CrossFit actually work for you? Or are you like a dance person? Like who knows what that actually means in the end, but yeah, to write your own rules and then be willing to test it out. I just think that's a beautiful way to get started. And don't judge it again. The comparison thing is something I really want to pinpoint as well. Don't compare your next evolution to somebody else's, Mm -hmm. you know, it, like you just said, if it's dance, then beautiful. Don't make that wrong. Oh, but I'm not CrossFit like so-and-so and look at her muscles and you know, it's just like, but is that what you want? Right. Or are you believing that that's better because of other people's perspective? Like what is true for you? And sometimes that water can get very muddy. We are so, we oh compare God. ourselves so much. Yeah, so yeah. that I think in prayer or meditation, whatever serves you to get really clear on what it, what is best for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you highlighted that let the judge take a, a take a rest let yeah. the gavel like go to the next room or <laughs> yeah. something while you You're like, can you stay here out. I'll come back for you but uh, yeah, yeah just not right now not right and the now. other thing that you pointed out which I think is super important is noticing the resistance and what's beautiful about that is that nothing happens in your comfort zone right as far as expansion or growth and if, if you're going to grow a muscle in any area, even if that's in your self-care area, you can't do it without resistance, right? Resistance, if you go to the gym, if you lift 10 pounds all the time and you want to grow your muscle beyond that, you're going to have to have bigger weight, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is more resistance. And so when you feel the resistance, check in. Is it because it doesn't feel right in your spirit or is it because it's the thing you don't really want to do, but you know you have to to get through it? And once you push past it, there's this beauty on the other side and you're so proud of yourself. And the other part is you have to celebrate your wins every day. What did, how did you win today? What did you do that moved you past that resistance and honor yourselves? I I recommend getting an honor journal, um, you know, and just writing down today. I, I went to the gym when I didn't want to today. I had a great conversation with my son in the car Mm -hmm. today and start to honor yourself because we're not taught to celebrate those things. And that's where a story can be made up that, you know, nobody cares. We're not doing good enough. You know, that, that judge is, is so at the ready. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that really stands out to me in like the way parenting happens um, in our current like cultural setup is that, um, you know, I, I always love the phrase, it takes a village. And I feel like historically there, there was an actual village, but now that village can feel very small. It can be very isolating. Uh, our connections are really different. And something that you've said to me in a previous conversation that I'd love to chat more about here is how do we like seek the community? How do we involve others in our life in this work so that we're not just trying to do it alone because then that isolation factor, right. is just going up and up and up instead of having more of what we want connection wise, what comes up for you in the, like, yeah, do it, (laughs) but don't do it alone. Yeah. You know, I love that. And I think it's so important because we are connection junkies. We just are like, we need it. Like think about an infant that isn't nurtured and held will perish. Mm-hmm. And we grow up and we think that we're different. We're no, no, I'm good. I got it. No, I'm got it. And it's like, it's not the case. We need that just as human beings, knowing that we're not alone in it because it can feel very isolating. So, you know, go to meetup.com and, and see if there's mommy groups in your local area. Um, you know, Facebook groups that bring community together or start one, mm-hmm. you know, it's just like, you know, uh, moms and 15 year olds, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and then put it out there and, and watch how many people want to show up. And the next thing you know, you're literally like, oh my gosh. So my son today, he came home and he told me he had his first kiss, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, that happened to me. And so now you're sharing stories and all of a sudden you feel like you have someone that gets you and understands and who, you know, it might be a moment you want to cry. Like, oh my God, it's his first girl besides me. You know what I mean? Like to be able to share those things, it just uplifts us and it's pulled us through the process of what sometimes can feel isolating and like nobody gets it, you know? Um, So I think that there's a lot of different ways nowadays, ever since COVID, I think it has forced a different level of connection that, you know, I don't think we were, utilizing as much in the past. Um, But now there's all kinds of ways to find groups that are willing to have those conversations. The only caveat that I would throw out there is 
especially if you start one, <laughs> make sure that you set the parameters that this is like, you know, a sisterhood or a parenting connection to uplift and not to complain. You know what I mean? That it doesn't become just a heavy negative thing. It's a, we're here to hold space for each other, but we definitely always want to uplift each other to see the greater good. Um, so that it, it doesn't, and, and if you're joining other groups to make sure you check in with that and that it doesn't become that because otherwise that can perpetuate the negativity and the weighted energy yeah, versus yeah. the expansion and the and the gratitude. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit. So you have grown children and they've seen you come through this whole process to the point where you're serving other people through this work. I mean that's a that's a big arc that they've witnessed. What what do they say what comes up for them like having a very different story than maybe you had growing up what do you notice gets to be like elements of their story that you feel excited about for them uh it brings up all this emotion as you mentioned <laughs> them because i have to say they are like the biggest witness to the evolution of me and who I was when I was married to their dad and wanted to die, you know, and how introverted I was and how much shame I lived with. And, you know, and to see where I am now, like they hold me in the highest place and it's what fuels me, <laughs> you know, every day. And I think that we, I, I feel, I think we all feel like we're just a soul partnership. Um, during the time of the divorce, my sons were 17, I have twins, okay. and my daughter was 15. And so it was a very rough time in their lives. My sons were uh, in their last year of high school. So, you know, in hindsight, <laughs> you know, had I do it to over again, I might have waited till they graduated, but it just turned out the way it was. It was the moment that I woke up to knowing that this wasn't survivable. Um, and so during that time, it was very tumultuous. And that was a part where I was just like so terrified that I was going to lose my connection with them because what ended up happening in the context of my marriage is because there was so much explosion with my ex, we kind of pulled together <laughs> and, you know, they call me and say, mom is at home. And I'd say, let me check, you know, and I'd call and then like, okay, we're going to so-and-so's house. And, and it became this like, pull us together thing. Yeah. And then yeah. when the whole thing happened with the divorce, they were so confused because I played the role and I lived the lie for so long that they'd are like, well, wait a minute, this is what we know. This is what is, how could you now not want it? And so I was so terrified and we went through a lot of you know, I, I feared losing them, but ultimately I always opened my communication with them. And I always said, whatever questions you have, even if I'm uncomfortable, I will tell you the truth. And I don't care what you ask me. And now we are together wanting to affect change in the world. My sons are sound healers um, and they use music to help heal energies in the bodies of trauma that has happened. Uh, my daughter is working hard to help the empaths and the highly sensitives mm -hmm. to help them recognize their superpower, you know, because they feel so much and she is such a, like she feels everything. And, and it's been hard for her to navigate those emotions, trying to understand, is that my emotion or is it what I'm feeling from others, you know, <laughs> and, and in her process, you know, now she's committed to helping. It's usually the geeks and the weirdos and the ones that are left behind and she just loves them. And so she's committed and convicted to helping them empower themselves and then, um, you know, help them use that as a way to love and bring emotional intelligence to the world. So from this stage, my perspective is my relationship with my children are one that I can be immensely proud of and grateful for. And I love the fact that we all have a perspective of wanting to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And we even think about you know, we, we are doing events as a family, um, but even more so speaking on stage um, in regards to the family unit. And even with my ex, who I, I believe that that's going to happen one day as well, just the full circle of that, because I just believe he was another soul partner that was meant to bring that adversity in my life so that I can wake up to be who I am today and now pay it forward. Hmm. 
I don't know if this is true for you, but what you just said really resonates super deeply that like when, when you can come to the point where like the, the worst thing feels like it was meant to be because it has given you like a whole different life. It's a really interesting point to reach. And I like pray for people of all kinds, right? Like any trauma you've been through, any hardship that you've been through, like, and, and I know that, you know, you've said this to me too, but to like take that pain and be able to turn it in to something super beautiful to me is sort of like the ultimate healing, the ultimate gift, like the ultimate compassion. Like there's so much that can come from that. Is there more that comes up for you around that though? Because like my experience is different than yours. I don't want to make an assumption about uh, how you feel about that. No, it's absolutely 100% on point. Um, Whenever somebody tells me what they've been through and some things are very profound, I see through the lenses of God must see greatness in you Mm. because I don't believe that God wastes the pain. I believe we do if we choose to, because if someone is alive and sharing with me their story, it means to me that they got through it. So what I see through the lenses of is that in the story of your pain, there's a a hero, (laughs) there's a champion in the arena of that pain that wiped his brow and got back up and still decided to show up in the world as a kind human being, or we wouldn't be having the conversation. So I believe that you can turn your deepest pain into passion and love and purpose Because you knowing that depth of pain gives you lenses to witness humanity differently. Absolutely. So now you, you, when somebody shows up, even in in anger or in unkindness, I say that is a reflection of their pain, not your truth. I was talking to a young lady who um, she was bullied and, you know, and so I was helping her realize that we don't have to own the daggers people throw at us, that if we're witness to why people are the way, I I believe that we're born in love innately. Love is innate in us. But when people have been hurt, people have been, you know, um, abused or beaten, or, you know, they, they create this armor around their heart that doesn't allow them to get to it as easily because they've been so hurt now they're protecting. So they show up sharp or they show up judgmental. And that's because there's an inner judge going on inside them. I'm this dirty thing because my dad told me I was a loser every day. So I walk around with the consciousness of I'm a loser. So if I'm a loser, you think I'm a loser. I'm going to fight you to show you I'm not a loser because this core belief is present. And so if you can look at all of your pain and see it as God, the universe chiseling you into this beautiful masterpiece to understand humanity at another level, then it wakes you up to recognize that all of it was in divine order. Mm-hmm. Like what if it was happening for you, not to you yeah. or from you, right? And, and if we don't look for the gift in our pain, then we will only remember the pain. Yeah. Yeah. That's so beautifully said. I'm glad I got to ask that question because I love <laughs> <Yeah>. the answer. <laughs> yeah, you've got great questions. Yeah. Last thing I just want to ask you about is, this is kind of like a two-parter, but you know, we've talked about courage. We've talked about sort of shifting this myth of like that self, it's selfish to take, you know, care of yourself. I would love to get your thoughts on, like, if I could have there be one belief, it would be that like doing right by ourselves is how we do right by our children. What do you think of when you hear that? Again, like before, like modeling what you want your children to become. Model it. If you have a ritual of working, like sometimes you see these videos of these ladies that are really fit and then they get pregnant and then 
they have the baby and they're doing push-ups with the baby on their back, you know, <laughs> they're still, you know, and then you see their babies like, you know, next to them as they're doing the yoga movements or whatever. And it's just like your life and who you are doesn't have to stop when you become a parent. Continue to be you in the context of, for moms, you, you were a woman before you were a mother. And I think that we lose that sometimes mm -hmm. just like, no, now my entire identity is I'm a mother. No, it's a part. It's a piece of you. And that will always be, but there's still a woman inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, another part of the work I do is, is, you know, helping women with their sensuality and to come back to that beauty of what it is to be a woman you know, and, and not sexuality, that's separate. I, I just, just the sensual being of nurture and love and, and touch and taste and, and sight, the beautiful things. And it's just like, you know, we don't have time for that. I got freaking baby vomit on my <laughs> shirt, you know? It's just like, <laughs> it's like everything goes out the window. And I just believe that we, we can't forget ourselves in the process. We have to be willing to, if we want our children to grow up and be beautiful, giving souls, that they must, that you can't give what you don't own. Yeah. And if you are wanting to serve others, you have to start with you. You have to start with your own belief system. You have to start with your own physical care, your own hygiene, your own mental and emotional. Those are so huge. We just shove that aside like it's not important. And, and one thing that you made me think of too earlier, as you were asking the question about turning our pain into purpose, is that I, I want to introduce forgiveness as a very big resource mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to allow us to find the gift in our, in our pain. Um, because sometimes you say, no, I already forgave that. It doesn't bother me. My past is my past. I don't live there, blah, blah, blah. But if you haven't brought the true essence of forgiveness, which I believe true forgiveness can only happen when you have found the gift of the experience, mm -hmm. because otherwise there's still a judgment that it shouldn't have happened. And like Byron Katie says, when you walk around saying that shouldn't have happened, she says, yeah. well, it should have because it did. It did. <laughs> right. And so anything other than that is you arguing with reality, which means you lose 100 percent of the time, right. you know, and I had a brother that was unfortunately murdered when he was 29. And back then, you know, if you would have asked me to find the gift in that, I probably would have punched you in the nose. And, you know, I, I was like, there is no good in this. This this is unjust. He was a great man, you know, and. But if I don't, again, find the gift, I will only remember the pain. So I can find forgiveness for even the man that killed him because I trust that it was in divine order. And now I see that every human being I serve with grief, I honor my brother's life. Mm. I was very content with living in his shadows. That wasn't God's plan for me. I wasn't meant to stay in the shadows, but I didn't want to go anywhere. I was very comfortable there. And so, you know, did he have to get ripped out of my life the way he did? I guess so, because that's the way it happened. And maybe I wouldn't have seen it any other way. I don't know, but I'm going to seek for the good in it versus my suffering. Because if I just think about how it shouldn't have happened and that sucks and who he would be right now for my kids, which I think about every day, I will only suffer. And suffering is really optional. Yeah, It's yeah. not something we have to live with. So I look for the gift in it. So I'm able to now bring forgiveness, true forgiveness, because when we just say, oh, no, I forgave that. It doesn't bother me. I don't think about it. But you haven't extracted the gift of that pain. Then there's still an edge that believes it shouldn't have happened yeah. when you find the gift. So I say there's a four step process. Number one, go back to the moment that hurt you. Number two, be witness to it. Be witness to you. Who was there? What was the experience? What happened? What was said? And then number three, find the gift. What, what else was true about the story? If you were verbally abused, but you still treated someone kind, hmm. how beautiful. If you were physically abused, but you wiped your tears and healed your bruises, but still protected your, your smaller siblings. 
Like there's a courageous person in there. There's a, a resourceful one that protected the child while she, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of other beautiful things in there that we aren't taught to see because the pain feels so big. And so when you're able to see the beautiful child or woman or whatever in the story that through courage, through resilience, through perseverance, got back up, that story is just as much true as the pain. And when you see those gifts, you see what God's plan. If God could whisper to you and could say, you know what, look, I know this sucks right now and I'm so sorry, but if you knew why I needed you to build courage right now, you would understand. Mm. We don't get to know. Yeah. What I didn't know when my father was sneaking into my room at night was that the courage I was building then I was going to need when I left my husband and I didn't have anywhere to live. Mm. I was going to need that courage, but I didn't know that when I was a kid. So I need to find that within so that I can see the expansion of me and why that was scripted into my divine choreography. It's just a breath to take that in. <laughs> when you just, that is so beautiful and powerful. Um, I love that you shared the four steps. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. I know everyone's going to want to find out more about how do they learn more from you? How do they get involved in, you know, what you have going on? Where should people go out, go to find more about uh, Jesse Torres? Well, you're welcome to go to my website. It's unshakablelife.com. Um, and that's that. <laughs> unshakable with an E at the end. Uh, make sure you spell it right. Um, and uh, there you will see, you know, what I'm up to. And um, there's a master class to walk you through the five shifts to help you come out of stuck and stressed into, you know, living a superhero life and conquering your world. So you have an event coming up. Uh, it will be unshakablelife.com forward slash live event. Um, and it is, um, I believe that to experience a immersion in four days is one of the fastest way to transform. Um, one thing I will say, we, we go into the deep end. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be willing to go in the deep end, you know, and, and, and not to live there. Yeah. But to find where the thread was that created any limitation within you, because I believe that there is no limitation to the human name, only the belief that there is one. Mm. And if we can unravel what those threads were and that divine choreography of your life, and we can rewrite the story, mm. you will find that there is no limitation to you and that you can be the unstoppable, unshakable, beautiful soul you were meant to be. And I believe my outcome is that when we are able to break free from all our heart armor and we come out in the purity of love my outcome is to build an army of angels people that transform and see their own divinity so that they can see the world that way because once you get to that place there's nothing you can't accomplish and when you do and you meet your goals all you want to do is pay it forward yeah. and i believe that's how we affect change in the world yeah the ripple effect who send those waves flying yes. <laughs> <Keep> <laughs> <it going. Exactly. laughs> Well, I'm just so grateful for your time today, Jesse, and sharing your story with us and just the, you know, super practical transformation and insights that you shared. Just really great. So thank you so much for sharing them with us today. And thank you everyone for listening and we'll catch you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.